Okay, this is the Unit 7 video lesson over the cell membrane structure and transport across the cell membrane. As you watch the video, please fill in the guided notes that I gave you in class and have those ready to turn in on the due date that I gave you. Make sure you pause and rewatch parts that you need to go back and review. And otherwise, make sure you take good notes, write down anything extra that I read on the screen in addition to the filling in the blanks on the notes page. Let's first take a look at what exactly a cell membrane looks like. So you can see here in the white box, I have put, um, I have given you a microscopic view of a cell membrane. It is these two lines here that make up our cell membrane. And we'll talk about how the cell membrane is um, structured and how the phospholipids fit together to make this possible. Right? Our cell membrane is important because this is the, the only thing in animal cells that is going to separate that the inside of the cell from the outside environment. First and foremost, the cell membrane um, is, has to be flexible. Okay, it's flexible because we are, uh, as animals, we're able to move ourselves. We are not stiff or rigid, um, and if for, especially for this unicellular organism, this protist that I have pictured here, um, you can see it's able to move and it's uh, able to interact with its environment because of the flexibility of the cell membrane. All right, homeostasis. Now, we know now that homeostasis means the balanced internal condition of cells, right? We have to maintain internal balance. This is one of the characteristics of life that we've learned about, okay? We can also call this balance equilibrium, right? Maintaining equilibrium with our environment. Our cell membrane has the job of, make, of controlling what enters and leaves the cell, enters and exits the cell. Okay? So the member, it was, it's able to determine who gets in and who gets out based on different properties, which we'll discuss later. But this job is very important in maintaining homeostasis for the cell itself. Okay? Notice here, it says plasma membrane. I want to take a moment and point out to you that plasma membrane means the same thing as cell membrane. Right? Those terms are interchangeable. Right, we have seven functions of our cell membrane that you need to write down. First, it serves as a protective barrier from the outside environment. Second, it's able to regulate, transport in and out of the cell. In other words, what's able to move in and out of the cell. And this term, selectively permeable or semi-permeable, is what we use to, to um, describe this type of cell membrane. The cell membrane also has properties that's going to allow from cell to cell recognition within the body. It's going to provide anchoring sites for parts of the cytoskeleton, our microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate um, fibers that can attach to the cell membrane and provide support and structure for the cell. It's going to provide a binding site for enzymes that are going to do important jobs in our body. It provides interlocking surfaces so that our cells can stick together. Because in, our, in animals, um, you, uh, our membrane, we have to be able to connect them to form. Our cells make up tissues, and our tissues make up organs, and our organs make up organ systems, and those organ systems make up the organism. So it's important that our cells can bind together and connect together. And so our cell membrane is going to allow that to happen. right? And lastly, it's going to contain the cytoplasm. So basically, it's what surrounds the cell and keeps all of the insides of the cell inside of the cell instead of bursting open and being lost to the environment. Okay, so now let's get into the nitty-gritty of the structure of the cell membrane. We're going to talk about several important components that make up our cell membrane and what each of their role is. All right, phospholipids is our first and foremost component. Phospholipids provide most of the structure of our membrane. Okay, so if you look here at this picture, these um, molecules here that have the red heads and the white tails, those, these are the phospholipids. Okay, if you notice here, you can see that the red heads are facing out and the tails are facing in. 
Okay, so this, there's a reason for this, and we'll talk about that in a second. The next one is we have our cholesterol. And cholesterol is going to um, provide an important role in making sure that we're able to keep our membrane fluid and flexible. So here's our cholesterols. These are kind of just interspersed into our membrane. Okay. Um, next we have proteins. Um, proteins are important in the membrane because they're going to help with transporting molecules through the membrane. Um, we have peripheral proteins and integral proteins, and we'll talk about the differences between the two. And lastly, we're going to have some carbohydrates, such as glucose, which are going to, um, you can see here, these carbohydrates are attached to the top of a protein. We would call this a glycoprotein because it's part protein and part sugar. And this glycoprotein would have the job of being a tag or recognize um, a tool in which the cell can recognize other cells and realize that, hey, you belong here, or no, you're an invader and we need to alert the immune system. Here is a really cool 3D picture of how this all works um, in our cells. You can see we have the big purple things. Those are going to be proteins here. You can see the cholesterol, so we have our proteins, cholesterol, all these little gray things are our phospholipids. We have some glycoproteins here. Um, so it's just a beautiful mosaic of all these different things. Okay, let's talk um, in detail about phospholipids and their structure. Their role is to make up the cell membrane, and they contain two fatty acid chains that are nonpolar, and a head that is polar, okay, because it has a phosphate group and a glycerol. So if we look closely over here, you can see the head is polar and the tails are nonpolar. These properties of phospholipids is going to be crucial because this is what determines how they are positioned in the cell membrane. We call the cell membrane the fluid mosaic model because you can see it's fluid because it's able to move, it's flexible, and the phospholipids are able to move from side to side like a liquid. Okay, We call it mosaic because it produces a pattern from above of all the different scattered protein molecules and different parts. So a mosaic is something that has many different parts and when you put it together it makes a picture. So this is called the fluid mosaic model. Now, we talked about the structure of our phospholipid. The polar head, remember, polar molecules love water. So we call these hydrophilic. So here's the polar head. This is hydrophilic. Okay? We have um, the nonpolar tails, which are hydrophobic. Okay? The fact that one part of the phospholipid is hydrophilic and one part is hydrophobic makes this membrane selective. Okay, because that means that the, the top part, the outside here, these are hydrophilic because this is where our polar heads are facing. And that makes the inside hydrophobic. So can things that are polar move through the membrane? The answer is no, because they are not going to agree with the middle part. So think back to when we did our solubility lab our, um, back in unit two and we mix the oil and the water together and think about how when we did that the oil and the water did not mix because the water was polar and the oil is nonpolar. so when you think about this it's like these the inside here wants to get as far away from the water as possible and so the tails face in to keep away from the water okay and the heads they love water so they want to be as close to the water as possible so they want to face outward so they can get close to the water. So the reason it's oriented like this is because of the polar and nonpolar nature, which makes these um, either hydrophilic or hydrophobic. So here's another close-up view of this um, from the uh, looking at the atoms that make up this molecule, the phospholipid. You can see we have the hydrophilic heads facing outside and towards the water and the nonpolar hydrophobic tails facing inside where there is no water. 
Right. The cell membrane is made up of two layers of phospholipids called the lipid bilayer. And the hydrophobic molecules can get through easily because the middle is hydrophobic, but the hydrophilic molecules cannot. So they're going to have to have a different way of being transported. Um, let's refresh our mind on solubility. Solubility, um, materials that are soluble in lipids are going to be able to pass through the cell membrane easily. Okay, so things that can dissolve in oil, things like oil can pass through easily. Small molecules and larger hydrophobic molecules can move through easily. So things that can move through the cell easily would be like oxygen gas and carbon dioxide. Um, that's going to be important for um, us especially because as we breathe in and out, the oxygen needs to be able to, to move into our cells easily and the carbon dioxide needs to be able to move out right? because it's a waste product. Um, another thing that's able to move in the cells easily is actually water because it is so small that it can get through easily. Ions and hydrophilic molecules bigger than water have to be able to um, use proteins through the membrane. They cannot move on their own through the membrane. Okay, so they're going to have to use a protein channel, like we'll talk about in a little bit, or a transport protein that will be able to move it safely across the membrane. All right, so now we've talked about the, the structure of the cell membrane. We've talked about why um, it is what, the way it is and our hydrophilic and hydrophobic parts. I expect you to be able to label the parts of a phospholipid, um, draw it, label the polar head, the nonpolar tails, and tell me that the head is hydrophilic and the tails are hydrophobic. So make sure you have all of that written down. So again, here is our phospholipid. The head is polar. Tails are nonpolar. Okay, if it's polar, it's also hydrophilic. Nonpolar hydrophobic, hates water. And if we had a membrane, it would be arranged like this with our tails facing in. Okay, so the first type of transport is simple diffusion. This requires no energy. So we're going to talk about transports that require energy and don't require energy. This one does not require any energy. It's able to move molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration. Okay, so I want you to think about moving something down a hill. Okay, if you have a ball at the top of a hill, here's our hill, we have a ball at the top of the hill, and we let go of the ball, where's the ball naturally going to want to go? It's naturally going to want to roll down the hill from a high altitude to a low altitude. So same idea with simple diffusion. In the, video, in the first part of this, all the dots are concentrated over here. Well, they move from a high concentration in this area to now they are all spread out. They have diffused out. That requires no energy. All right, diffusion in itself is talking about how things move across the membrane. This is a passive process, so things that don't require energy are called passive. Okay, this means that no energy is going to be required to make the molecules move. So you can see here that if we have less of the oxygen in the cell, the oxygen is naturally going to want to move into the cell. It's going to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. So passive goes from high to low and no energy is required. This is a, a good example is if you put a drop of dye in water, over time it's going to distribute into where it's evenly distributed in the glass of water. Okay, This is because it, the dye moves from a high concentration in the middle to it spreads out into where it's evenly distributed because it's going from high to low. And again, this does not require energy. This is passive. Um, here is an example, another example of diffusion through the membrane. You can see here we have a high concentration of solute, like sugar or salt, on this side of the membrane. Here's our cell membrane right here. And these, this is moving 
across the cell membrane into the cell because we're going from a high concentration to a low concentration, right? We are not wanting to use energy. We are not having to use energy. This is what naturally wants to happen. So we, when we say this, when we see this, this means the solid is moving down the concentration gradient. Okay, think of going down the hill from a high concentration to a low concentration. Again, this does not require energy. Okay, osmosis is a special term that we use to talk about just the diffusion of water. Okay, um, you've probably seen that movie Osmosis Jones. That has nothing to do with this, and no, we are not watching it. Um, but anyway, so diffusion of water is movement of water across the membrane. This moves water from a high concentration to a low concentration, okay? Same idea as diffusion, going from high to low. Just like diffusion, no energy is required, okay? No energy is required for osmosis. If we had this, these water molecules, the yellow ones are the water molecules, we're going to move, this, and this way would be our high concentration, and this side would be the low concentration. So take a minute and tell me which direction the water is going to move. Good, it's, she should have said it's going to move this way. We're going down our concentration gradient, we're going from a high concentration to a low concentration. All right, here is a short little clip of this. If you watch this, you could see the, um, let's go back and watch that again. You can see the water moving across, going from an area of where there's more water to where there is less water. Now, another way to remember this is that if there is more water, that means there's less solutes. So let's look at these green dots here. These are the solutes. These are like our salt, okay? And the salt, if there's more salt, we have to have more water because salt sucks the water, okay? So if you spill something, you can put salt on it. It will eventually dry it up. Um, if you have ever have put a, a glass on a wooden table and it's made a ring on the table, okay, discolor the wood. If you put salt on that, it will take the ring out of the out of the wood, right? Because salt is going to suck the water out because the water is going to go from where there is less water, more water, to where there's less water. And the salt, if there's more salt, that means there's less water. So on this left side, we have high water potential, low solute concentration, right? Not a lot of salt. On the right side, we have low water. We don't have as much water, but we have a high solute. So the water is going to move from left side to the right side from where there is more water to where there's less. In our cell membranes, we have aquaporons. Aquaporons are special proteins designed just to help water move across the membrane quickly and effectively. And these protein pores are the what are going to be used during osmosis. Okay, when we talk about osmosis, we have to talk about tonicity. Okay, and this is talking about concentration of water in, and solutes inside of a cell versus the environment. All right, the first type, we have three types of tonicity, and the first type is isotonic. So in an isotonic situation, iso is going to mean equal movement. So in an isotonic situation, we're going to have no net movement because the water is going to be moving into and out of the cell at an equal rate. So if we look here at our concentrations, you can see we have 90% water in the environment and 90% water in our cell, which means we have 10% salt in our environment and 10% salt in our cell. Okay, so this means it's equal, right? There's the same amount of water outside the cell as there is inside the cell. So the water is going to move in and out of the cell at an equal rate. In an isotonic solution, this does not mean that there is no movement at all. There's just no net movement, meaning that we're moving in and out of the cell at an equal rate and it's not changing in the concentrations. Okay. So when we say this, we say the cell is at equilibrium in an isotonic situation. Right, in a hypotonic situation, the cell 
is place in an environment where there is more water in the environment than there is inside the cell. So let's figure out the direction of the water movement. So we have 90% water 80 outside and 80% inside the cell. Where is there the most water? Well, the most water is in the environment outside the cell. So we said the law of osmosis says that water wants to move from high concentrations to a low concentration. So if there's 90% outside, 80% inside, that means there's more outside than inside. So the water is going to move into the cell. Now, if the water moves into the cell too much, what can happen is this can cause the cell to swell up and eventually burst. Okay, so it can cause the cell to eventually burst. This is not something that is good to happen. Okay, so when you think of hypo, let's think of hippo. It causes it to swell up like a hippo because there's more water outside than inside. All right, a cell in a hypertonic environment. So if you're hyper, hyper, you're losing energy, you're, you, you've eaten a lot of sugar and you're burning it all off, you're hyper, right? Well, hypertonic means we're going to be losing something. So if we look at our concentrations, we can see that there is 85% water in the environment, 95% water inside the cell. When we compare our that to the concentration of our... Um, solute, there is 15% salt outside the cell, 5% salt in. Remember, I told you earlier that salt sucks. So wherever the salt is, if we put this at the cell in salt, it's going to pull the water out. So the water is going to begin to move out of the cell. Okay, this is going to cause our cell to shrink or shrivel. Okay, so our cell's going to look something like this afterwards. Now, if you ever heard of putting salt on a slug, this is what happens to the slug. Okay, it's causing the cells on the slug to lose water and shrivel up, okay, because it's creating a hypertonic environment. Not good for the slug because it will die. All right, so here is um, a picture of the cells in different types of solutions. These are red blood cells. So this is a red blood cell in a hypotonic environment. You can see it's swelling up because it's gaining too much water. This would be a cell in a hypertonic environment. You can see that it's kind of shriveled up because it's losing too much water. And the last one is a cell in an isotonic environment because it is moving in and out of the cell at an equal rate. Okay, I want you to pause the video now and label on um, in your guided notes these six different types of cells we have the top three red blood cells label those as being hypotonic hypertonic or isotonic and do the same thing with the plant cells and then resume the video Okay, so these are terms you don't need to know unless you're in pre-AP. Um, cytolysis means the cell is bursting. Plasmolysis is going to mean the cell is shriveling. So cytolysis is going to happen in a hypotonic environment when the cell gains too much water. Plasmolysis will happen in a um, hypertonic environment when the cell loses water and shrinks and shrivels. Um, here is some actual pictures of osmosis in red blood cells. Which one do you think this one on the far left is? Hopefully you said isotonic because it looks like it's pretty um, normal. The one in the middle, what do you think that one is? This one is going to be hypotonic because it is swelled up with lots of extra stuff. What about the last one? This one's going to be hypertonic because it is shrivel it is um, shriveled up and um, lost its shape. Good. 
Okay, we're going to move on now past this. Let's check our answers here. You should have, um, for this, hypotonic, hypertonic, isotonic. For the plant cells, you should have hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. Right, we have three forms of um, transport across the membrane that are passive. We have simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and then we as two types, and then we have one we have active transport that can also move things across the membrane. So going into passive transport, we talked about diffusion a little bit earlier. Simple diffusion is the first type of passive transport. It does not require energy, and it moves things from a high concentration to a low concentration. So our example is going to be oxygen or water moving into a cell and so like carbon dioxide diffusing out, right? Because we need to exhale and get rid of the waste. Facilitated diffusion still doesn't require energy, but instead of just moving directly through the phospholipid bilayer, we are actually going to be using transport proteins to help move the, the molecules through. Okay, examples would be like glucose or amino acids moving from our bloodstream into a cell. So after we eat a meal, our cells need to take in glucose, okay, so that our mitochondria can break that down and give us ATP. So these red things here would be like glucose molecules. They're too big to go through the membrane by themselves. So instead, they have a special tunnel, channel protein, that's going to allow it to get through safely to the other side. Okay, facilitated diffusion is still going from high concentration to a low concentration. Okay, it is still passive. The only difference is that now we are using a protein to get through to the other side. The proteins in the membrane provide structural support, recognition, communication, and transport through. So we're focusing most on the last part, on that they are helping with the transport of molecules through. The first type of, of uh, transport protein is a channel protein. And this is going to be like the one we just talked about with facilitated diffusion. It kind of acts like a little pore to help move materials from one side to the other. The second type is going to be a carrier protein, and this one's going to actually change shape to move the material from one side to the other. Carrier proteins can be either in facilitated diffusion or active transport um, across the membrane. Here is a little video of facilitated diffusion. The purple pieces, those are our protein, that represent our protein channel. You can see the little orange molecules moving through the protein channel to the other side safely. So these are, they are providing pores okay, for the molecules to get through. And again, those are called channel proteins or protein channels. This would be an example of a carrier protein. You can see the purple grabbing the little red molecule and moving it safely from one side of the, of the membrane to the other. So sometimes the protein doesn't have to go all the way through the, through the membrane. It can simply bind and drag and move things through the membrane to the other side safely. Here's another example of a carrier protein. It is changing shape. So once the molecule binds, it's able to move out to the other cell. It causes the protein to open the other way. So they move or change shape to move things across the membrane. Now let's talk about active transport. So in active transport, this is going to require energy or ATP. Right? So we've talked about ATP as the energy that the mitochondria produces. Now, in contrary to the um, passive transport, active transport requires energy because it's moving things from a low to high. So this is going against the concentration gradient. So if you think about a hill, now we have our ball at the bottom of the hill. We're trying to get to the top. This ball does not naturally want to move to the top of the hill. You're going to have to push it and roll it to get it up to the top of the hill. So you are putting in energy to get it there. Okay, So this requires energy. An important um, example are the, the sodium potassium pumps that are, exist in our neurons that help to send a signal down our neuron. Okay, That's our sodium potassium pump. So here is our sodium potassium pump. For every three sodiums pumped in, there are two potassiums pumped out. 
which is going to work to create a membrane potential so that our neuron can actually send a signal down its pathway. You can see the little red ball that comes in at the bottom. This is our ATP that is fueling, providing energy for this protein to work. In addition to having things moving um, across the membrane from low to high, sometimes we have to move big stuff or move lots of things at once. And these are moved in vesicles. We've talked about the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is actually the organelle that makes these vesicles to be shipped out. If something is leaving the cell, it's going to leave the cell through exocytosis. Okay. This is moved, the vesicles move through the cell and fuse with the cell membrane. And then the contents are released out here, out of the cell. This is an important way of how hormones are going to be secreted and how our nerve cells are actually going to be able to communicate with one another. So exocytosis is very important in releasing things out of the cell. Here's an example of exocytosis in real life view of, under a microscope. So you can see here the vesicle has fused with the membrane and the, all of this stuff is being released out of the cell. The next type is when we have to move things into the cell. There's actually three parts of endocytosis. So exiting the cell is exocytosis, bringing stuff in is endocytosis. Um, you can see, con contrary to exocytosis, endocytosis, the membrane actually folds in around the items and the vesicle forms to bring it into the cell. The first type is called pinocytosis. Pinocytosis is when it's, it's called like cell drinking. This is the most common form. And this is when um, it's just bringing in small parts or things from the environment. So look here at the little example, you can see the membrane, the red membrane folding in, and you can see the, it's bringing in those little molecules into the cell. So this is a type of endocytosis. If you are in on level, then you, all you need to know is that this is endocytosis. If you're in pre-AP, I expect you to know this is pinocytosis, a form of endocytosis. Here's an actual um, macroscopic view of pinocytosis happening. You can see the pink fluid bringing in, this coming in, being brought into the cell um, through the cell membrane. Right, receptor mediated endocytosis means that sometimes we have these receptors on the surface of our membrane and the molecule has to bind to the receptor to be brought into the cell. This is going to be the case for certain hormones, cholesterols, and things like that that should need to be brought into the cell. So here is our little example. You can see those two molecules, once they fit into their little receptors, that signals them to be brought into the cell. Remember, all types of exocytosis and endocytosis are requiring energy to work. The last type of endocytosis is called phagocytosis, or cell eating. This is going to be um, used to engulf large particles, such as food if you're a single-celled organism, or maybe bacteria if you're a white blood cell. Okay, so this is going to be bringing them in to get rid of them or to digest them. Okay, this is an example of a white blood cell bringing in a bacterium. The purple thing is a bacterium, and it's going to take it to the lysosome where the lysosome then digests it and gets rid of it so it doesn't harm the cell or the body. This is an example of phagocytosis. This is why sometimes we call white blood cells macrophages. Here is a white blood cell under the microscope. It's about to um, take in that bacteria. So phagocytosis is about to occur. Again, here's another picture of this. Um, you can see the white blood cell engulfing the yeast cell, which is the yellow um, ball looking thing. And it's going to bring it in and break it down. So just a quick recap, exocyte, endocytosis and exocytosis are opposite. So exocytosis, we are releasing the um, stuff out of the cell. 
the vesicle fuses with the membrane and is released out of the membrane. Endocytosis, the opposite of that is happening. And both of these require energy. Okay, so this is the end of our notes. I know this was a long video. Uh, make sure you have everything filled in and are ready to turn it in on your due date. Have a great rest of your day.